Cool. So I wanted to ask you first, because I know you've talked about this in, in some of your interviews, about music as a character on this record. Because um, I know you told NPR that um, on Geyser, the you is music. So how does music work as a character on Be the Cowboy? Well, music is less of a character. And I think um, the characters are the protagonists singing the songs. Mm -hmm. Music isn't the character. Music is something that has been sort of like a constant figure in my life. So it's not necessarily just be the cowboy. It's just throughout my life I've, I've written love songs to music or the act of writing music. Mm -hmm. I feel like that sometimes happens in the music industry, but it's usually like attacking the music business. Like, I won't write you a love song. It's not usually so romantic, I guess. Well, in my mind, music is not the music business. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't write a love song to the music business. No, I don't think many people would. <laughs> <laughs> but I just love the art of music. Mm -hmm. And it's been my, throughout my life, I haven't had friends or I haven't felt close to any community, but I've always had music, so. What was the first time that you really kind of connected with music, like when you were a kid? I always loved music, but the first moment I remember crying to music was in first grade. We were singing the theme song to that movie, Castle in the Sky. And I just started crying, not because of anything that's said in the song, but just being overwhelmed by how beautiful I thought it was. Mm -hmm. And all the kids in class were like, why are you crying? And <laughs> I, I didn't really understand why. How does it make you feel that people, I think you've talked about this recently, like cry to your music, or they get so overwhelmed, you know, in an audience while you're, while you're up there singing and, and weaving the story for them. It's incredibly validating. Yeah. It makes me feel useful. I think what I want most in the world is to feel useful. Mm -hmm. And I don't have many other skills. I don't have another trade. So just knowing that something I made or something I contributed actually means something to other people, mm -hmm. really validating. Yeah, I don't know if that's something you feel more nowadays, but like the need to be useful and not just make something for yourself, but like, I don't know, that's something that has an effect, at least on somebody, like one person. Has that amplified for you, like since you've been more in the public eye or has this just always been something that you've been striving for? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. an underlying current of need to make music. Yeah. I don't feel like a lot of people have that. I feel like it's, you know. Um, I think it's a really good thing that a lot of people don't have that. I think I have that because I have always felt a lack in everything else in my life. And so I kind of clung to music. Clinged to music? Clung to music? I think clung. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's accurate. Um, so if you don't need music like I need music, it probably just means you're fulfilled in other areas of your life. Yeah, I can see that. I think some people feel, I don't know if you feel this way, like that you, you have to always be wanting or like slightly unhappy to make art. Is that mm -hmm. how you feel or is that specifically just how you feel about yourself? I think that myth is incredibly toxic yeah. because it demands artists to be unhappy. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it, it keeps us from, for example, um, thinking about how to create a better work environment for artists, you know, or mm -hmm. how to take care of artists' mental health. It keeps us from thinking about those important things because we're like, well, artists have to be unhappy. Yeah. So I don't think that's healthy. I think my, I think my being unhappy or happy or however I feel is just being human and it's not so much being an artist. I, can, I could not be an artist and still feel the, the same things I feel. Mm -hmm. But you have somewhere to put it 
as opposed to just feeling, I guess. Like you have a... I guess so, but people can also go to therapy or people can also put love into their jobs or put love into their families. Mm -hmm. I just, I would hate to um, equate unhappiness to the ability to create art. Yeah. I think that that's a, a fallacy too. Like, I think everybody has to be in a certain mental state, whatever mental state that they need to be to, to make something. And I think a lot of, you know, the unhappiness and, and badness in the music industry lately has just been like mistreating artists because that people assuming that that's how artists are supposed to be living. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, how have things changed since puberty too? And like the anticipation for this record, for you? I can afford to take a taxi now if I need to. Yeah. That's, and I have more things to do. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, change is gradual. It's never been overnight for me, so maybe two years from now I'll see how it's changed for me from puberty two to this album, but right now I can't, I'm too in it to really see it. Yeah. I can see that. It's like how you look at the 90s when you're in the 90s and you're like, there's no culture here. Mm -hmm. But then you look back and like kids are wearing chokers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's all clearer in retrospect. Yeah. Um, but I guess, you know, you said music isn't a character in this record, but I'm interested in kind of the characters that you created for it. Because um, I know you're probably in there in a lot of ways, but it seemed to me kind of like short stories about like kind of noir. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering what, what you were tapping into into this record and kind of what storylines you were interested in. So it's funny, I don't, I don't think of any of my songs as fiction mm -hmm. because they're all in a way things I've felt and things I've wanted to express. It's just that sometimes using a character or using a narrative that didn't actually happen in my own life is better expresses what I really felt in that moment. Because mm -hmm. sometimes the things that trigger your emotions in your own life are actually incredibly mundane and wouldn't make for a great story. Yeah. Um, so for example, the song Me and My Husband, I don't have a husband, but I've experienced what the character has experienced in terms of emotion. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, what is the most exaggerated uh, way I can express this emotion? And I used a like a like a stereotype of a like a housewife in mm -hmm. the suburbs or something, or someone who's just been married for a really long time and being dependent on your spouse mm -hmm. and just kind of deciding that that was your life. Yeah, I love that song. It's just such a like when you listen to it first, it, it's such a happy song or like something maybe people would play at a wedding and then you listen to it further and look at the lyrics and it just kind of peels it away. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean about like sh short stories. It just feels like there's, there's more going on in a song than just what you're singing. Mm -hmm. um, do you write any other kind of fiction or no, poetry? No, no, I'm not no. a prose writer. Yeah. I've done it for fun, but then I would read back what I wrote and I would just understand that I'm never meant to write prose. I think you write prose with music though. Like there's so much more, like when you look at the lyrics to a song, it's so much shorter than it seems mm -hmm. when you're listening to it. Like mm -hmm. there's this whole world that you're creating like through music. And I think maybe that comes from the fact that you actually know so much about music. Mm -hmm. I, I think you were talking recently about like having those tools in your toolkit. Um, and I'd love to hear more about that, like your knowledge of music and how you're able to, to tell a story that way. Um, well, first of all, I still, I'm still very much an idiot about music. I still don't know enough at all. Mm -hmm. You could study music for a lifetime and not know enough. But I guess the tools in my toolkit are just kind of like, they come from listening to pop songs and seeing how they're structured or trying to read 
between the lines, beyond the lines, mm -hmm. um, playing different instruments, making different kinds of music and drawing from all of that. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't think I have nearly a big enough tool toolkit or, or I'd, I'd rather I'd like to learn much more about music because I'm still very still don't know enough but yeah I think that's a good position to be in instead yeah. of being like I'm like a maestro <laughs> um what's a pop song that you've been kind of deconstructing lately it's like a really interesting there's a k-pop song called um call me baby mm -hmm. by uh this band I don't know what you would call a k-pop a group by this group called EXO, EXO. Mm -hmm. And the chord progressions in that are just fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there anything like that you kind of studied for this record that you then applied to any of the songs? Um, I tried to go against what I always fall back on. Mm -hmm. Like I, whenever I want an intense emotion in the song, my instinct or my fallback plan is just to add in a, a shit ton of, uh, add a lot of... You can swear. <laughs> <laughs> add a lot of distortion to mm -hmm. a guitar or add a lot of guitar layers. But I thought, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to become the distorted guitar artist. Yeah. So how, how else should I express that emotion that I would otherwise use uh, otherwise expressed through a distorted guitar. Or mm -hmm. my instinct is always to follow a very classic pop song form, like verse, you know, mm -hmm. pre-chorus, chorus, etc. But I fought that instinct and tried to write songs that didn't always follow that song structure. Like with Geyser, it's just mm -hmm. A section, B section, C section, D section. Mm -hmm. So. And maybe like nobody yeah. kind of where you reach the right the chorus as it were like at the end right well the just i'm actually quite proud of nobody in the fact that i i got away with making a chorus that was just one word over yeah. and over <laughs> well i feel like that's what you were saying too about when you usually would add the distorted guitar mm -hmm. um i saw the story that you were talking about um like screaming on the floor mm -hmm. um about being lonely and yeah kind of like rasping out nobody but in that song it's it's pretty. It's yeah, I do. I do a lot of repetition of words, single words over and over in the album, and I, I did that because I kind of wanted to express a sort of mania, mm -hmm. a sort of like fixation, maybe the mental state of someone who would just repeat a word over and over and over. Yeah, I think that's kind of a, um, I don't know, like an anxiety mm -hmm. thing too, like a touchstone word. Yeah. Or you just need to, I don't know, compulse. Yeah. Um, I was really interested too in the some of the imagery, um, like the was it the horse called cold air? Mm -hmm. That's just such a beautiful. I don't know. I'm sure everybody has their own image of what that means. And I'm just wondering, like, where those kind of images came from for you? Like, did you dream them? Did you hear mishear a phrase? Like, how did that? Um. There's something about animals that are forced to compete mm -hmm. by humans. Something about that that really fascinates me. So I'm really fascinated by racehorses and like dog fights or, fights or dog races or just kind of like situations where animals are made to fight or compete. Yeah. There's something incredibly horrible about it and human about it. So I always kind of come back to those themes. So in this song, I, I, think I, I think I saw somewhere that racehorses always have interesting names. Yeah. And I saw somewhere that there was a horse named Cold Air, which mm. I thought was beautiful. Yeah. But then I went back on Google and I couldn't find it. So maybe I actually dreamed it, I don't really know. Um, but I just imagined a horse that was named a racehorse that was named Cold Air. And that horse used to be, people used to say that that horse ran like a storm, but now it's old and tired and 
its heart is like just a, a lake with no fish, so an mm -hmm. unmoving, still lake. Um, and something about that image was very beautiful to me. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the betting on losing dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have an affinity for the, you know, the under, underdogs? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Uh, I don't like. I don't like to see myself as an underdog. Yeah. I don't. I'm not a victim, you know. No. And I don't. I don't know. I think there's there can be something really unhealthy about that. There's almost something egotistical about assuming you're the underdog, like you're supposed to be the champion, but everyone is bringing you down. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe something a little male. I yeah, know. something yeah. a little male. Male musicians <laughs> yeah. who are like, man, like yeah. Pitchfork is against me. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, we were doing um, the video for the washing machine heart. And that's another kind of image to me that, I, I don't know, like, I don't know how, how you come up with such visceral depictions of how things feel, but I'm curious, you know, the washing machine heart, where'd that come from? Yeah, the, I just thought of the heart as a washing machine that this other person, this careless person just tosses their dirty shoes into. And I don't know if you've ever tried to clean your shoes by throwing them in the washing machine, but they go dum, 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 yeah. dum, dum, dum. Very loud. <laughs> so something about that, just like someone else making your heart pound really loud, uh -huh. but also someone else using your heart to clean themselves. Yeah. Yeah, there's like some meme on the internet about how like women are free therapy mm -hmm. for men, <laughs> free yeah. washing machines, yeah. I guess. <laughs> for your dirty shoes yeah. and baggage. Um, yeah, it seems like love kind of crops up a lot on the record and kind of whether it's putting on makeup and high heels and walking to a room or the washing machine heart. Um, obviously not going to ask you like about your personal life, <laughs> but I'm curious to hear a little bit about how love functions in your music. Um, I think in my music, when I'm talking about love, I'm rarely talking about real love. Um, I'm mostly talking about power and fixation and loss mm -hmm. um, because all those things show up in the form of love or in the form of relationships and we're just kind of like figuring out how to be humans through each other mm -hmm. yeah so I, do, I don't I don't know if I've written many pure love songs about just being in love with someone and being in a good place about that yeah yeah how would you define love like actual love? Um, I, f I feel like I'm too young to really know, mm -hmm. um, but I guess love is wanting to be good for another person. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a cliche, but I think it is incredibly selfless, but you're not thinking of how selfless you're being. You know, it's a natural feeling of wanting somebody or the world to truly be a good place or truly be, have a good life. Yeah. And not like get credit for yeah, it's making not, I life mean, better for somebody. I think if, if, if you're really, if you really love someone, you're not thinking about what it does for you. Mm -hmm. Do you think if you, you said that you're too young, do you think that when you're older, your music will change in terms of depictions of love? Or I guess you can't really no, see into I, the future, but. I would think so. I think so much of pop music is about infatuation yeah. and attraction, and that is, most definitely one side of love, but I would love to, uh, I would love to explore more sides of it in music, like with two slow dancers, you know, mm -hmm. I, I wrote about two people who once had some kind of 
history, but they're much older now. They have lives, but for one dance, they're coming back together to kind of experience that and realizing they're both the same people they were when they were teenagers or whatever. Mm -hmm. I just, I would like to hear more love songs about all the complexities of it. Yeah. Maybe like having the love of a, ch a child or a parent or um, the love of a thing or an experience. I don't know. There's mm -hmm. so much more to love than just you look so hot on the dance floor. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the, the the love song's kind of, it's like one point of view. It's not like a team point of view yeah. it's like i love your body and yeah like um yeah you don't know that you're beautiful like not so much like like the two slow dancers it seemed like they were both having a conversation mm -hmm. as opposed to you know the man looking at the woman mm -hmm. and being like you're the same girl you were yeah in the gym <laughs> uh, <laughs> no i love that part about the gymnasium smelling the same mm -hmm. no matter where yeah um that would be interesting to, you know, open up that perspective. Yeah, I think it's just difficult because <laughs> the, the world wants consumerist love songs. Mm -hmm. Like love that leads to consumption. Yeah, or vicarious, yeah. I guess. Like romance novels or mm -hmm. porn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to think of like a very good love song. I don't know if you have one that's it's your favorite well I mean actually I don't know who wrote these songs but uh, speaking of something current there's the Whitney documentary mm -hmm. I think Whitney's I have nothing is really great mm -hmm. I will always love you although that's a um, what's her face Blonde country singer who's amazing. Dolly Parton? Dolly Parton. That's yeah. actually a Dolly Parton song. Um, yeah, I'm, I think I'm just thinking of a lot of Whitney Houston songs just because I was recently thinking about the Whitney Houston documentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess those are, those were kind of the songs that maybe like other people sang too, like standards mm -hmm. or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those strike a nicer balance, like true love ways or like, mm -hmm. you know songs that are made for lots of people to sing. Yeah. Yeah. So is there anything else you want people to know about your record and you <laughs> or things uh, you don't want them to know? <laughs> what are things about my record? I just hope people give it a shot. Yeah. I think people are pretty excited. Cool. Yeah. I just, I would like, if you haven't heard Be the Cowboy, I hope that you are not wanting Puberty 3, because mm -hmm. you might not get that. Yeah, not as many like, you're American girl, yeah. Or, yeah, which is a great song. I mean, I think it's a different record, but it's you. It mm -hmm. doesn't sound like someone else. Yeah, good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank for you coming to this couch and <laughs> talking to me in the rain. Cool. Hey. Thank you. Thank you.